President, fellows and guests. Uh, as you just said, I, I took quite a long break from archaeology. Uh, I started work on the ivories in Roman Britain together with uh, objects of bone and antler to do my PhD in the early 1980s. Um, and it was really in the 80s when I collected most of my material. It was then when Sonia and I first uh, got acquainted when I was a student and Sonia was in the conservation department. Um, then I took a break for 20 years and when I um, reappeared in archaeology, um, I was also reacquainted with Sonia, but in the meantime, um, she developed a new skill as part of her postdoctoral work, as you've heard, in terms of identification of various um, skeletal materials, one of which was ivory. Um, and I had the pleasure of um, a three day tuition uh, from Sonia on how to identify various types of objects. And all I can say is, I wish I knew now what I knew in the early 1980s because my PhD might have been slightly different. Um, however, um, I very quickly realised that to do a talk on ivories, we really needed to do this together because to appreciate what actually is an ivory and what isn't from Roman Britain, because one of the biggest issues you'll hear has been the identification, uh, you really need to understand um, how you can actually identify these objects in the first place. So tonight, this evening, you, you have a, um, an act from both of us. Uh, Sonia's going to begin by talking about the actual material itself um, in terms of the identification, uh, and then uh, I'm going to follow that with, and, and here's the material that we know of so far from Roman Britain. So I'm going to hand over to Sonia to begin. As a, an archaeological conservator, it was always very important to me to know what the material was that I was working on. Uh, if you misidentify something, you might mistreat something, and that could have really quite bad results. And uh, the York Archaeological Trust, we had a lot of material that was coming in, was beautifully preserved and exceptionally preserved. So material that um, wasn't normally found on archaeological sites often, but also in a state of preservation that we didn't recognize as well. And uh, that's really when I got started working uh, uh, with these materials. But it wasn't until um, as student, um, Stephen said that I uh, managed a few years ago to do my uh, postdoctoral um, studies on um, skeletal materials worked into cultural objects, which was funded by the uh, EPSRC and the AHRC's uh, Science and Heritage Fund. And this gave me three years to really bring together all that I'd learned over the previous 30, 35 years, and uh, validate and um, evaluate uh, different approaches to identification, and also to develop uh, more the skills for visual identification, because most of the other approaches um, can be destructive. Um, but what we want to talk about today is the ivories, and uh, what are ivories? Although ivory is often the term used as shorthand for elephant ivory, it's really the dentine of teeth. The dentine is the material, the main body of the tooth, and um, it's built up in minute layers over uh, the pulp cavity. And we see here a human tooth on the left, and you can see it's quite a complex cavity in the center, and the layers of dentine as they're laid down successively over that um, pulp cavity gradually close the pulp cavity down, close the roots down until the, root, the roots are, are, are squeezed up and uh, basically the tooth stops growing. But in open rooted teeth, like uh, elephant tusk, you have a conical pulp cavity and more layers, uh, as more layers of dentine are laid down around the pulp cavity, um, the pulp cavity remains open and it's just like stacking ice cream cones in each, in, in, into each other. So that gradually the tusk um, grows down and forwards away from the, the skull um, and more ice cream cones are pushed in at the back. So the newest, most recent idea is right up around this pulp cavity. And so when you look at this material in cross-section, it's made up of um, cone within cone shapes of fine layers of dentine that you can really only just see under magnification, uh, one after another, around uh, a conical uh, pulp cavity that has an oval cross section. And there's no blood vessels in the dentine, 
the blood vessels are all in the pulp cavity. And uh, so that makes it very different from bone and ivory, where you have a blood supply ramified throughout the material. Um, instead, there are minute tubules called dentinal tubules that keep the, the material hydrated during life and uh, uh, transport uh, uh, fluids in and out of, of the material. But elephant ivory is not the only ivory that was available to the Romans. Um, they had access to hippo ivory from Egypt. Sperm whale ivory from our own shores here. Certainly the use of sperm whale ivory, as I've indicated here, go back certainly into the Bronze Age. We're getting a, a lot of uh, pommels uh, on daggers which are either cetacean bone or actually cetacean ivory being cut usually from the teeth of sperm whale. And of course, there's smaller teeth as well, some of which are big enough to provide chunks of material which are um, substantial enough to cut objects out of them. And this is just a little gaming piece here from a very roughly cut piece from the tusk of uh, a pig. Um, these tusks, these curved tusks, do tend to crack longitudinally and produce plates of material. And this um, uh, helmet from Cyprus, uh, a date which I can't remember, I'm sorry, uh, is uh, uh, an example of how those plates might have been used, at least a, in a decorative form, um, if not uh, as, as something more protective. Identifying ivory, so there's lots of pitfalls here, uh, and there are a lot of common mistakes that people make in identifying them. Yes, something like the Goodman and Plain. Um, there's very few materials that it could be made out of other than a large chunk of ivory from a large tusk, most probably elephant. But you can get large chunks of compact tissue from whales, from the jaw of sperm whale, for instance, uh, which would be bone. Um, another thing that people often uh, think of is that uh, anything that is highly or intricately carved is going to have to be ivory because who would put that sort of work into something that was just made of something as worthless as bone? And of course, bone's only butchery waste after all. And in fact, an awful lot of the pins that I see that are highly carved are actually bone and not ivory, as people hope. But of course, when you do cut something rectangular from a circular object like a tusk, uh, like the, um, you do end up with small pieces of ivory um, around the edges. Uh, which, of course, do get made up into smaller objects. And um, here's some bangles, for instance, one of which is elephant ivory, and another one which is a fragment from a bangle of identical cross-section, joined in the same way with a little bronze um, fitting, um, but it's in antler. So that's the other mistake people often make, because something's been published as ivory somewhere, maybe correctly, they assume that their object of the same form is going to be ivory as well. And um, this has led to a lot of objects being identified as ivory quite erroneously over the years. Identifying ivories chemically has its problems. All ivories and bone and antler are all chemically very much the same material. They're a combination of uh, a structure made from the protein collagen stiffened with a mineral, a calcium mineral, which we call bioappetite. Detailed chemical analysis of this, uh, using the most non-destructive techniques, such as vibrational spectroscopy, uh, can differentiate between some ivories. And there's been some success in being able to show um, an ivory as a, from a marine source rather than a terrestrial source. But a lot of the work that I've reviewed, um, which tries to take this further and separating different sorts of ivory, I'm afraid the differences that they're picking up may well just as much be differences between individuals with different diet, different vocal geology, different states of health, and that may be causing greater differences in the spectra that they're getting than the difference between the species. Add to this the sort of contamination you get from archaeological sites, you've only got to have a little bit of dissolution of calcium or uh, a small amount of magnesium um, being absorbed by your, your material, for instance, and your ratios will change, and the results you get really don't mean very much. It just means you have contaminated material. DNA, of course, 
where you do have um, uh, preservation of DNA is a very powerful way of identifying material to species. Um, there are problems of contamination. A lot of objects have been in collections a long time and have been handled. Um, and there's also the problems of decay. Uh, and DNA isn't the most stable of the protein molecules. Uh, um, and the more broken up it is, the more difficult it is to be sure exactly what you're looking at. And certainly from archaeological sites, this can be a real issue. Proteomics, a more recent development, is very, very useful. Proteomics looks at the collagen, and collagen is much more stable. And that collagen, depending on the, the components of the collagen, uh, the fine detail, can allow you to differentiate, say, goat from sheep, for instance. I know that um, we're talking about ivory here, but uh, it will allow you to separate elephant from walrus, for instance, um, in ivory. Um, but it can't often differentiate between species. So African and Asian elephant, um, you can only separate using DNA. And neither technique is going to tell you what tissue you've got. Uh, you may, in fact, have bone and not ivory. Uh, so you really need to look at the structure and these results together in order to get the full picture. And looking at the structural detail is what I do and what I tend to promote because it's the most non-destructive way of looking at this material. It's non-invasive, you're merely looking at the object using light and a low-power microscope um, and uh, recording the information usually using a, a, a digital microscope and camera and uh, you don't make any changes to the object at all. Uh, the object at the bottom here you see in detail on the right is bone. I can see here we have a vascular structure, we have blood vessels running throughout this and no matter how uh, beautifully polished and finished and carved this object is, it is just bone, it can't be ivory because it has a blood supply. But reading these objects requires that you know not only to look for things like blood vessels, absence or not, you actually have to read them in the way that we would do, for instance, wood identification. Because of the way that these materials are laid down, the ivory is formed, you cut it in different directions, you will see different structures. And as I say, it's like looking at wood. At wood, to do a, an identification of a piece of wood, you'd ideally look at a transverse section, a radial section, and a tangential section. Putting all the information together from those tells you that you've got walnut wood in this case. And so the same it is with ivories. Looking at transverse sections, or sections as close to transverse as you can get, radial sections, tangential sections will give you completely different information. You put that all together and you can come down to differentiating one ivory from another, walrus from elephant from hippo, etc. And one of the most characteristic things about elephant ivory is a pattern we call the Schrader pattern. And we can see that on the example, uh, the transverse section here on the left. And that is um, running across the very, very fine layers of the, uh, the dentine itself, which are more or less running, uh, the, the layers of dentine here are running more or less uh, vertically through that end section. You've got, it's overlaid with this pattern of crisscrossing lines, which form these little dark and white lozenge shapes. And this is called the Schrader pattern. And it all comes down to the organization of the dentinal tubules within the ivory, uh, which is very, very uh, particular. And it produces this pattern, which you do not see in any other species of ivory. And that Schrader patterning, um, does allow us to do things. Um, <clears throat> to a certain extent, we can use it to say, yes, we have an elephant ivory rather than a mammoth <coughs> ivory. Because it's not just the extant elephants that show this, the extinct uh, species as well also um, show some form of patterning. And when you look at um, mammoth ivory, right out of the edge of the tusk, what we call the, uh, just below the rind of the tusk, the outer angles in the Schrader pattern, they always remain below 90 degrees. But in extant elephants, uh, that angle gets flatter and flatter and flatter as you go out towards the rind. Uh, it becomes greater than 90 degrees and often almost completely flattened 
so that the shredder pattern is hardly visible at all. And then we can say we have elephant ivory, but only if we know we're right at the edge of the tusk can we do this. What it can't do is separate Asian elephant from African elephant. That can't be done. So we, we can't take it down to absolute species. And here's an example of um, that uh, there's been a long debate about Anglo-Saxon bagrings. Where is the source of this from? I can't say if it's African or Asian. I can tell you it is elephant and not mammoth from the Schrager angle because we have, for instance, on this particular piece, the cementum. And you can see how the Schrager angle isn't just an optical effect as it appears in the modern pieces. It's actually a physical um, orientation, change in orientation of the structure of the ivory, so that when you get decay, often it's enhanced. And you can see that here in the uh, continuous rising and falling of the surface uh, in the same uh, way that we see the lozenges uh, elsewhere. And the only way to separate um, the species, as I've said already, is using DNA, which of course is destructive, and mostly we can't really afford to do that uh, at all. I also went looking for the non-elephant ivories um, uh, during my um, uh, postdoc. Uh, I wanted to know, um, we, we know that a lot of ivories are coming into this country at certain periods, um, and a lot of them are not elephant ivory, but where were they? But certainly in the Roman period, virtually everything I did look at that was ivory was uh, elephant ivory. And the frosted cork dye was particularly problematic and had been passed around for generations. I think I saw it three times over the years. And um, it had been to the Natural History Museum and all sorts of places, and people looked at it and said, well, it's an ivory. We've got these fine lamella layers, there's no blood vessels, but I can't tell you what sort of ivory. And in fact, in the end, through the work I was doing, I was able to confirm it was elephant ivory, but it was one of the examples where the Schrager pattern really wasn't very visible towards the center of the tusk. And the only non-elephant ivory that I did come across of Roman date uh, was the South Cave Sword Cache, um, which was actually, um, <coughs> although mid to late first century, I think we may have a better date on it now, um, and uh, deposited at the time when the Romans were just across the Humber to the south. Um, it's, it's an Iron Age material, but uh, as I say, that close, the Romans were clearly just across the water and presumably trading was going on uh, backwards and forwards. And here we have this cache of swords, five swords with handle components, some of them rather smashed up. And looking at these, I was able to identify antler, cetacean bone, cetacean ivory, sperm whale tooth, elephant ivory, and horn. Um, and uh, here's a diagram that shows a little more about the detail of how they were distributed between the pieces. And now, we'll have a little further look at Roman idols. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start really where, where Sonia left off. One of the, the key difficulties that we still have is identifying when is something ivory and when isn't it. And from when I came back into archaeology, my list of Roman ivories, having now been taught by Sonia, has shrunk by 33%. Um, <clears throat> but we still see quite often things identified as ivory, um, which, which aren't. Um, and one of the things I learned quite early on from Sonia is just applying common sense um, to some of the objects when you look at them. And I've just picked out a couple of examples. Um, this is um, a, a series of Roman box hinges, and the picture in the middle shows uh, how they actually work. Um, these are cut quite clearly from um, either cattle or horse bone, and they're a very, very common type. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these um, identified throughout the, certainly throughout the Western Empire, um, dating to the first and early second centuries. Um, but just occasionally, and the ones you see are there on the left-hand side, they are identified as ivory, but there are in fact not a single example um, of one of these hinge segments uh, which, which are ivory, they are all made of bone. Um, you sometimes see Roman ivories identified by what I've called association. Um, many people in this room will remember Hugh Chapman. Hugh Chapman wrote a paper in 1976 um, identifying the object on, on the screen now 
as a ivory, it's a Roman scabbard slide, which basically works uh, the way that the illustration shows above. Um, in Hugh's paper, he also published uh, an illustration of a very, very similar, so this illustration the other way around, looking at the other side, uh, scabbard slide from South Shields. Um, he didn't say that it was ivory, um, but when it was next published, and it's now been published four times, it's always been described as ivory. And it's been described as ivory because, in Hugh's paper, he did publish one ivory one um, from London. And I'm sure that's why the South Shields one, which is very clearly, when you look at it closely, not ivory but bone, uh, has been so described. And just occasionally you, f you still find a very, very rich burial, um, and this is a burial uh, very recently published, excellent publication in Britannia, uh, of, a great, of a find from Colchester with four very small feet which have been published as iron free. Um, I've blown this up as much as I can, um, but nowhere on there can either I or Sonia actually really identify, for example, a Schrager pattern. Um, and we haven't quite got to grips with these yet. They could be ivory, but we feel it's probably an un unlikely attribution. So there still remains a big, big problem um, in the literature today, but it is possibly from small objects. Um, I hope those of you at the front can just about see where the arrows are pointing, um, that you can see uh, the Schrager pattern. This is a small peg. Uh, only a few centimetres long from Silchester. Um, very clearly this is um, of Roman ivory. Um, and quite often, uh, it's very, very obvious that the objects you're looking at uh, are of ivory. And just, I just picked out three, not, not to scale, um, a penknife handle, a clasp knife handle uh, from Roman York, uh, a razor, minus its, most of its iron elements from Carlisle, uh, and very much blown up, end of an ivory bracelet. And on each of these, you can see the features uh, that Sonia uh, has been talking about uh, earlier on. Um, so let's just um, very briefly take a look um, at the wider context of ivories um, in the Roman and uh, slightly earlier world. Um, there's good literary evidence that ivory has been a valued product uh, for a long time. Uh, and there are a few references um, to the actual value of ivory, uh, which can clearly value, uh, vary over time. Just a few examples. In the 3rd century BC, uh, we're told that the, the ivory market was flooded by Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus, and the price dropped to 1 15th of what it had been 100 years earlier. Uh, just moving on into the Roman period, um, uh, into the imperial period, uh, in the first century AD, uh, the price went up quite a lot, and Pliny, uh, probably right in the 70s, tells us um, that ivory was very rarely obtained except from India. Um, African ivory was very rare in the first century AD. In the mid-second century, uh, for evidence from the papyrus in Egypt, uh, we're told that the value of ivory uh, was about the same as the value of silver. But moving on and looking at Diocletian's edict, uh, the market by this time had been flooded uh, by a new source of ivory uh, from East Africa, and we think that at this stage, in the early 4th century, it only had 1 40th of the value of silver. So compared to maybe 150 years earlier, uh, the value had dropped from equal with silver to about 1 40th um, of the same price. Um, there's plenty of evidence of the trade in both tusks and of the elephants themselves, and of course on the finished objects that I'll come back to, uh, and there is some literary evidence that ivory was hoarded. In terms of actual workshops, um, the only good evidence for a workshop um, actually comes from 4th century um, Rome, but there is other evidence uh, from Rome that ivory was worked there. Uh, so for example, um, there are seven inscriptions of the 1st century BC and 1st century AD uh, which mention ivory workers. They are all male and they are all freedmen. Pliny mentions a female who engraved images on ivory, as well as working as a painter. Uh, there are ivory workers mentioned in the second century. Um, Oppian mentions ivory cutters of inlay. Uh, in the Hadrianic period, um, there's evidence of ivory, people working with ivory and, and citrus wood together. Uh, and the Imperial Edict of 337 includes ivory workers 
uh, amongst a group of artisans exempted from public service in order to improve their skills and instruct their children. So there is other evidence as well, that's, that's just by way of a bit of a background. Um, from Britain, um, there is one small piece of evidence, which is a sawn piece of ivory, which comes from a second century context at Verulamium. That's the only piece of evidence for working of ivory um, in the Roman period uh, from Britain. Um, and just to remind ourselves, yes, there was a trade clearly in Tusk, but sometimes the trade was in the finished objects. Um, so from Pompeii, um, there's an Indian ivory figurine, and from Borsium in Hungary, there's an Indian ivory comb. Um, so how was the industry actually organized? Um, we know uh, from literary refer references that there were factories operating as early as the 4th century BC. Just for example, there was one factory using ivory which was um, producing couches which employed 20 slaves. It was also um, making weapons. And they were selling off their byproducts, presumably chunks of ivory, uh, to other people. And as far as the funerary couches are concerned, as you'll see in a moment, these continue through uh, at least into the late first century AD. And just looking again at literary references, um, at least three, if not four, Roman emperors were buried um, with or, or on their funerary pyre, laying on a couch decorated with ivory. And we do find quite a number of these burials. So um, here's a, a distribution map of uh, rich burials with ivory couches which have been through the funerary pyre. And there is, of course, one country not on here, uh, which is Britain. Uh, but not to be outdone, uh, we have two examples. Um, there is a very, on the left-hand side of this slide, there's a very small piece of a funerary couch in ivory. Uh, which, and I've just illustrated there, where, where does it come from on the actual leg of the couch, which is from 2nd century Verulamium. And there's a very famous burial, uh, the so-called Child's Burial, uh, which is pre-Flavian from Colchester. Um, but that's not ivory. That's actually every single piece of that. It has been described on occasion as ivory, but every single piece uh, is of bone. So it's very much not quite up to the same standard as the ivory couches, um, which more or less date to the first century BC until around about 50 um, AD plus a bit, which is perhaps one of the reasons why we don't find more examples uh, from Roman Britain. Um, but it is clear there was uh, an organized workshop producing, in particular, funerary couches. Um, we don't know exactly where, probably more than one. Um, but certainly not um, in Britain. There's limited evidence throughout the rest of the Roman world for other forms of manufacturing in an organised sense, which was using ivory. Um, I've just got two or three more potential examples. Uh, in the late 1st, early 2nd century, uh, you find these razor handles. I've already shown you the one from Carlisle. Uh, there's a slightly more battered one from Richborough. The uh, one on the left, the drawing from London, is also an ivory, uh, as is the one from Vindanissa, just to show you that these are actually quite widely distributed down, certainly down the, the length of the Rhine. The one from Vralium is in bone, and um, I've chopped half of this um, inscription off, um, but it shows the workshop of Lucius Cornelius uh, Artemis from 2nd century AD, and the more eagle eyed of you should be able to make out that on the bottom row there, Every other one of those um, objects is a razor of the type uh, that you can see here. There's about four examples in ivory from Britain, um, but these couplers and perhaps others like them were clearly using ivory, iron, uh, there's lots of bronze examples which have wood infill. Um, so a whole variety of materials used, um, but perhaps the most rich of those uh, was ivory. Um, moving on into the, probably into the, the later Roman period, uh, the top left hand side there from York is a pair of fan handles. There are other examples, but not many as you can see from the distribution map on the bottom right hand side. And not all of these are in ivory, the two uh, on the bottom left are from Mites uh, and are probably 
of bone. Um, you can see just from the cross section there that they're not going to be uh, of, of ivory. So again, perhaps small organised workshops somewhere produce these very rare objects, um, principally in ivory, although again there's only about eight examples known, but in other materials as well. Um, and finally, oh, that's just how uh, the fans are represented in uh, various tombstones, uh, the most famous of which uh, is probably the one on the left-hand side from Cumbria. Uh, and then moving right on to the late Roman period, uh, Sonia's already shown you a picture of ivory bracelets. Um, probably in the second half of the fourth century AD, when we're told that ivory, once again, is quite common uh, and quite cheap, there's a, a significant number of ivory bracelets produced. There were a lot more until Sonia told me how to tell the difference between ivory and antler bracelets. Uh, and it's interesting going and looking at some of the large cemeteries which have published uh, a lot of bracelets as ivory. For example, at Black Hills, many of the bracelets published and identified in the 70s before I even started work on my PhD. When I went to look at those for the first time a few months ago, quite a number of those which are published as ivory are in fact not ivory um, at all. Um, nevertheless, um, if you look at the number of ivories from Roman Britain, almost 50% of them are actually bracelets and date to the 4th century. So maybe evidence of four workshops um, at different periods uh, working in other materials but in including ivory. Um, so let's move on and have a look at some of the nicer uh, ivories that we have. Uh, I'm sorry, I've tried to put all these on the same um, page um, and the scales are, are slightly different. Um, but these are all quite small, only a few centimetres um, in height. These are the only ivories that I'm aware of which actually show freestanding figures in, in, in any way. The one from Gestingthorpe on the bottom left, unfortunately now uh, I think he's lost and he's quite a small piece. Uh, the one on the, the drawing on the right hand bottom side from Hoxney has recently been published as a very, very, very small piece of an ivory pixis dating to the very end of the 4th century, maybe even into the 5th century. Uh, and the other finds on the, uh, the top line here, two from Carlian, uh, one from Greenwich Park, uh, and one from Lexton, are all freestanding, but probably come from um, boxes. Um, well, I was in Ephesus last year, and I thought, well, I've never seen anything like this, just possibly something perhaps not as grand as this, but some scene, and the ones in particular from Carlian all have nail holes in them, show that they've been attached to other objects. But as far as Britain is concerned, that's it in terms of nice freestanding ivories. Um, it's interesting when you look at much of the western provinces, uh, the Germanys and, and the Gauls, you find a very similar pattern. You don't find hundreds and hundreds of ivories. It's not just in Britain where they're uncommon. Um, this goes throughout most of the uh, Western Roman Empire. Uh, perhaps the, the most common, uh, commonly illustrated find from the whole of Roman Britain is the South Shields Gladiator. Here's a page of um, just uh, a few of the different publications. It's a class knife handle of broadly dated 150, 250, so it's mid-2nd to mid-3rd century. There are lots of class knife handles in other materials, um, but in ivory, they're very rare, there are only three uh, from Roman Britain. There's one from Southwark, a rather nice example, um, together with a chain which had a key, probably had a key on the end, uh, one from a, a pit in Silchester. The Southwark example was from a 4th century grave, so it was obviously a curated item because it was at least 50 to 100 years old when it was placed in the grave. Uh, and there's the South Shields Gladiator. But that's it. And when you look all the way down the Rhine, where quite a number of uh, class 5 handles have been published, um, the number we have from Britain in true ivory is not unusual. That's about the same number uh, that you find there as well. And here's just a, a, a page of other gladiator clasps just to show there are lots of them, um, but only one from Britain uh, is in ivory. The, the middle one there from Kyle Went has, was in fact published as ivory, but uh, you can see from here that in fact it's not ivory, it's bone. Very closely paralleled to the one on the left-hand side, which is from Avanche, which is in true ivory, and you can see some of the, the splitting of the, the ivories, which is dried out, that Sonia referred to um, earlier on. 
Now, I think because there are lots and lots of class five handles with figures on, mostly in bone, there must have been some sort of industry producing these, um, perhaps in Britain, perhaps down the Rhine, uh, or, or in more than one places. But there are no closed parallels. This is about as good as it gets in terms of a closed parallel. So I suspect most of these were actually made uh, to specific order. And of course, uh, the Goodenham Plain that Sonia's all, already referred to is the largest chunk of ivory that there is from Roman Britain. Uh, uh, unusual object to find in ivory from a late 4th century sealed context. Um, so we know it is, it's a good sealed context. So we know it's, it's uh, Roman, found with other tools as well. Um, but a, a remarkable and very, very unusual piece. And just to return to some of the more common ivories that we find in Britain, military equipment. Uh, we know that in the Roman army, you could buy bits of your own equipment, and we find a great smattering of different parts of swords, in particular, made from ivory. Here's just a small selection of them. I've included an illustration from Mainz, uh, where there's a, a rather nice, complete ivory handle, pommel, uh, handle, and, and guard. From Britain, we don't have anything like that. There's all just odd uh, pieces, not always found on, on military sites, mostly from the first century, although the three in the middle, uh, they're the, the scabbard shapes from York, from Nettleton, uh, and from Greenwich Park um, are of late second, third century date. And just occasionally, you do find parallels for the military equipment. Here's a dagger handle from London, um, just about paralleled by one from Heddenheim, and the reconstruction you can see on the left uh, shows you what the uh, normal bronze or sometimes iron dagger handles look like. But on the whole, most of the ivories that you find from military equipment, again, are one-offs. There's no good evidence for uh, a big production centre producing bits of military kit uh, in ivory. And the most, apart from the Goodenham Plain, the next really unusual thing is the South Cave swords that Sonia has already mentioned. I wanted to put this on just to remind us that this is a really, really unusual amalgam of an Iron Age tradition and a Roman tradition of two different types of ivory found on the same object. So, just looking at chronology um, of maybe what's the organised production, the four examples that I've used um, throughout the Roman period, the others also span throughout the, other, uh, throughout the Roman period. Maybe a few more in the first century AD, and certainly a lot more in the fourth century, but remember that mostly of one type, which is the bracelets. Um, this is uh, a distribution map not drawn up by myself, but uh, by uh, Ella Eckhart in her recent book, which shows you that ivories actually occur throughout the whole of Roman Britain. Um, and so you might have gathered by now that what there is of ivory in Roman Britain is rather sparse uh, and um, not very common. So how much ivory is there actually in Roman Britain? Well, I think about two elephants worth. <laughs> it's probably actually only one and a half. Um, but as this was Sonia's elephant, I didn't like to cut it in half. Um, the only evidence that there were ever any real elephants um, in Britain comes from Dio, talking about the Claudian invasion. Um, now, this is one of the translations of the actual phrase in, in Dio. Remember, he's writing a very long time after the Claudian invasion. And what he says um, is that um, there were elephants amongst the extensive equipment which had been prepared. It doesn't say that the elephants actually ever got to Britain. And yet, if you read some um, accounts of the invasion of Roman Britain, modern accounts, you find Claudius arriving to set a triumph in Camelodun with his elephants. Um, and you even see a number. Some I've seen 12 and I've seen 16 reference. Um, but Dio doesn't actually say that. Um, so whether there were ever any real elephants in Britain or not uh, is really unknown. Um, and what about what sort of objects are there? Well, you can see there now a number. I have on my list, it did start off um, before I was properly trained by Sonia, about 140. It's now um, only just over 100. It's 101. And the first number there is the number of contexts. And the reason why the number of contexts is smaller than the absolute number is 
quite a number of the ivory bracelets uh, are found in the same grave together. So there's, 100, there's only 105 good Roman ivories, and some of which uh, I haven't gone back and checked on yet. I suspect that number's going to shrink even further from, well, let's call it 360 years of Roman occupation of Britain. So at the moment, we only know of about one ivory for every three or four years of Roman occupation um, in Britain, and many of those, like the bracelets, are very small fragments of ivory. And when we look at the types of ivory objects which are talked about in classical literature, some of those we find um, in Britain, like, uh, for example, the dice. Sonia showed you a picture of the, the dice from Froster Court, which is, in fact, the only ivory dice from Roman Britain. Uh, there were seven uh, published in the literature. There are seven published in the literature as ivory. Um, there is, in fact, I think only one that is really uh, true ivory. And where do they all come from? Well, perhaps it's no great surprise. Um, they come mainly uh, from large urban centres such as London, Colchester, uh, and York. And then uh, the next in the list is military sites, which obviously include most of those pieces of military equipment. And then a smattering uh, from other types of site, but mainly it's from the main cities of Roman Britain. So in conclusion, um, the ivories from Roman Britain are typical in that they're very, very few in number. They're very difficult to parallel. Um, but it's a similar pattern throughout most of the Western provinces. So in that sense, Roman Britain is not unusual. But they occur right the way through the Roman period. They are the most common, if common uh, we can actually say they are, in the major towns. Um, many have been misidentified. I'm pretty sure still on my list of just over 100, uh, there are a few more on there uh, that will bite the dust when either Sonia or I actually go and get to have a look at them. Uh, and they most probably are all imports. Um, we've only got one example of uh, a piece of working, a piece of waste, which is from Roman Varelanium. And the one thing that we can say in conclusion, in Roman Britain, ivories, not only are they exotic, but they're also very rare. Thank you.